Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our online services here at Palmetto Church of Christ. We're so glad that you could join us. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to begin our worship service. If you've watched us before, you kind of know how this goes. In just a moment, I'll lead us in prayer, and then we'll sing a song together. Thanks to our Palmetto singers who have been coming in on some Saturdays while social distancing and recording some songs for us. We appreciate them so very much. We'll sing a song together, and then I'll have our message. After that, we'll sing another song together. And then Andrew Thompson, who usually is our worship leader, is going to do our communion thoughts for today. And then after we have another song, one of our shepherds, Tom Beach, is going to lead us in prayer. And so that's kind of the way it's going to go this morning. And by the way, before we start, before I say a prayer, I want to thank the guys who are back here serving this morning. Uh, Kevin Klein, who's doing our sound, and Bob Smith, who's doing the live stream, and Chris Bryant, who's back there doing the PowerPoint. And also, don't forget, Wyatt Holton, who's doing our security in the back, just keeping us safe. Thank you guys for being here. Appreciate the work that everybody puts in in order to make this happen. And we pray that you're going to be blessed by the service this morning. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we have mentioned many times what a strange time this is to live in. But, Father, we know there's one constant, and that's our relationship with you. And, Father, we know that the Spirit, your Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that resides in every Christian still brings us together this morning. Even though we may be apart physically, that we're still together spiritually, we know that we join beings in heaven who are already praising you. And I ask this morning as we sing these songs as we take of the Lord's Supper, as we hear a message that we would be able to focus in on what you would have to say to our lives. I pray that you would use whatever I have to say this morning to your glory. Father, we continue to pray for those who are on the front lines of this epidemic, for the doctors, the nurses, the first responders, for those who are working in those essential jobs, uh, some of them even putting their lives on the line because of their own personal health problems in order to serve us. We pray for them and their safety. We pray for the end of this distancing, the end of this quarantine. We pray that businesses that have had to stop, have had to close their doors, would be able to open back up. Especially, Father, we pray that you would guide those in leadership as they determine when this happens, that you would give them wisdom. And now, Father, as we sing this song of praise to you, may it come from our hearts. May we think about the words that we are singing. All this is done to your glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. We praise thee, O God, for the sound of thy love. For Jesus who died and is now God above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise Thee, O God, for the Spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, by the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, by the glory, revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who was born of sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of all grace, who has bought us and sought us and guided our ways. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Hallelujah, Short with thy love, may soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thy the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy the glory, revive us again. Some of you may recognize Rubber Ducky here. Uh, he first made his appearance a couple of weeks ago in the baptistry as I was speaking. I just wanted to bring you up to date 
and let you know that uh, he has placed membership. <laughs> that since he was baptized, we've added him to the rolls. <laughs> whoever, whoever the joker was, they put him in the baptistry. Thank you for that. We appreciate, we appreciate the joke. I just wanted you to know that he has now placed membership here at Palmetto. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm sure my wife will say you shouldn't have done that. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. We're continuing our series in the gospel of Luke. Luke the physician writes to Theophilus to give him an account of the life of Jesus. As you know, the gospel of Luke is part one. The book of Acts is part two. Uh, And so we're going to look at Luke chapter 12 this morning, beginning in verse 13. So let's read that. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool." This very night, your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You know, in the world of capitalism, becoming a success means, and go ahead and bring up that next slide, means that you find a consumer's need or problem and fix it with your product. That's the key to success in capitalism. Find a consumer's problem or need, and then you fix it with your product. It's a, if it's a practical problem, then of course you come up with a practical solution. Recently, I used duct tape to fix uh, a, a water hose that we have at home, so I didn't have to buy a new water hose. Duct tape is great, isn't it? Uh, I found that Amazon Prime is terrific. I don't have to leave my home to buy things like clothes and food and things like that. Google Home, I own one of those. I just found out recently that if you buy some other things, it'll automatically adjust your temperature. It'll turn the lights on or off in your house. It'll give you the weather forecast. And I know it also reminds you to take your medicine. (laughs) And if the problem is an emotional one, well, Coke will make you smile. BMW will make you successful. A trip to Disney World will make you happy. The best advertisers know they're not just selling you a product. They're selling you a feeling. They're trying to reach your heart. And there's some guys and gals that are paid a lot of money and and spend time thinking up ways to grab your heart. You know, recently, our world has been turned upside down. Uh, We've had small businesses who are struggling to stay alive. Some have had to lay off their employees. Uh, We even wonder how many of them may never open their doors again. Not only that, this crisis has exposed our healthcare system. It showed us that we were really not prepared for this kind of pandemic. And thanks be to God that the numbers have been lower than they thought they would be. And this pandemic has also exposed that many of us have a very lack of faith in our news media and in our government. I've read posts from individuals, for instance, on Facebook who don't know who to believe when it comes to their safety and what they should be doing. Now, on the other hand, I've seen, so have you, the ways in which this pandemic has been a blessing. Some folks, uh, you know, for some folks, it's like the merry-go-round has finally stopped. They've had a chance to get off and catch their breath. Families are actually spending time together having dinner together, playing games with one another. Even the planet, have you read about this? Even the planet has benefited from this momentary pause. In China, the pollution is down. Uh, They're able to see even some mountains they weren't able to see before. We know that in Los Angeles, that's normally so polluted, they're able to see clearly. They even said that in, in New York, you could hear the birds chirping on Madison Avenue for the first time in a long time. So what has happened has been incredible. You might even, 
in one sense, call it this great pause, an incredible gift. I'm not talking about the virus. I'm not talking about the deaths. Of course, that's horrific. But what this crisis has done is given us a once in a lifetime opportunity to see what would happen if most of the world stopped. And we're in that moment right now. Stores are closed. Restaurants are closed. Uh, Streets are clear. And if you're like me, of course, it feels really weird because there's nothing quite like this that's ever happened before. And what I wanna encourage you to do this morning at the beginning of this message is to pay attention to how you feel at this very moment. I was thinking yesterday, I'm so ready for this to be over. I was fantasizing as Elaine and I, we were out on the deck, back deck in our home and I was fantasizing about, you know, the first time we have some folks over and what we're gonna feed them and what we're gonna eat and how we're gonna enjoy that so much. Uh, You know, frankly, I even yesterday at one point thought, you know, I think I'm feeling a little bit depressed. Can any of you relate to that? Are you ready for this to be over? You know, we're being told this will all end, that things will eventually get back to normal. And of course, being the consumer society that we are, it'll be a perfect time for Apple and Walmart and Best Buy and stores like that to say they can help us feel normal again. You know, to have that latte from Starbucks, to buy that that new pair of Nike shoes, to have a night out where you go to a movie and out to your favorite restaurant. Now, and by the way, let me be clear about something right up front. I'm, I'm all for capitalism. I, I'm a fan of capitalism. In fact, if you study history, you know that capitalism has raised more people out of poverty than any other system. Capitalism has been a tremendous force for good. And I want our economy to recover quickly. I want us to come back strong. I want these businesses, especially the small businesses, to be able to open back up and rehire their employees. But at the same time, I hope we don't forget the lessons that we've learned from this great pause. I wanna encourage us this morning to think deeply about what we put back into our lives after this great pause. This is our chance to redefine, to have a new version of what's normal, to listen, for instance, this morning to the words of Jesus and to hear him when he talks about what makes a life richer and happier and, and realize what life is about. One of the things I've clearly seen in this crisis is how deeply we care about one another. Maybe you've noticed that too. I've seen it in this congregation, for instance. I've seen it through the Facebook posts. I've seen it through the phone calls. I've seen it through the social distancing birthday parties that some of us have had. And this is our chance to define a new normal, to determine how we spend time with our family, determine how we use our nights, how we use our weekends, to choose what we watch, to choose what we listen to, to choose what we buy, and how we even spend our money. You see, there's another virus, I believe, that's even more deadly than COVID-19, and that's the virus of greed. In fact, I think more people have been infected with the virus of greed throughout history than any other virus. One of the ways that you know that is, did you know that uh, 16 out of the 38 parables of Jesus deal with money and possessions and how we use them? Here's a simple definition of, of greed that's, that's here on the board. It is a desire to have an intense desire to get more and more stuff. Has, I like the way someone else put it. They said greed is a desire to have more and more of what we already have enough of. Hmm. Most of us have been infected with the disease of greed more than we'll be infected by COVID-19. In the parable this morning, Jesus deals with that topic. He is among a large crowd when suddenly a man calls out to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And Jesus uses this opportunity to teach him about the dangers of greed. And that's what I want us to go through this morning, to go through this parable and to see What Jesus says are the dangers of greed. And the first danger is this. The first lesson we learn is that greed causes conflict. That's obvious in the story, right? If you look at verse 13 again, I hope you have your Bible open because we won't have these passages on the overhead. We'll just have the main points. But remember in verse 13, uh, Jesus began the story by saying, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? Now, 
This is the background to the parable that Jesus is about to tell. There's an angry guy in the crowd, and it seems it's because his parents have passed away and they left an inheritance. Apparently, his older brother is not willing to share the inheritance with them, so he's asking Jesus, would you please settle this family dispute, this squabble? Now, 21st century seems a little odd. We wonder why he would stop a teacher and ask him to handle his personal affairs. It seems to us, you know, why don't you get a lawyer? But understand, in the first century, it was not uncommon to appeal to a rabbi, to go to a teacher and to say, give me some counsel for my personal life. That's part of what rabbis and teachers would do. But in this situation, please notice the guy doesn't seem to be asking. He's demanding He's telling Jesus, make my brother give me some of the money. Make him give me some of the inheritance. And you can tell by the way Jesus responds that he's not very happy the way this guy has phrased this. The Bible scholars, in fact, tell us the very first word that Jesus says is a tip-off to the fact that he, he's saying, I'm not going to be made into a Judge Judy, all right? He's not going to get involved in this family squabble in verse 14 when he replies, man. And when Jesus uses the word here in, in the Greek, man, he's, he's like saying, hey, pal, or maybe even closer to something like, listen, you knucklehead. Now, I don't think Jesus would have called anyone a knucklehead, but that, I mean, that's kind of what this word is leaning toward, if you understand. Jesus is not about to get involved in his family squabble. And he's going to talk about greed because one of the reasons is greed causes conflict in relationships. There's a Dr. Kent Hughes who who writes a wonderful commentary on Luke. And just before he comments on this parable, he tells a story that was related to him by one of his English professors in college. And his English professor told the story of how she was one of six sisters. And the five other sisters never moved far away from home. They stayed near their parents, living in the same town. Uh, But she, however, got married. She moved several states away. Well, one day she got a phone call, and her mom said her dad had passed away. So she and her husband got on a plane, and they flew home. And they knocked on the front door. They were greeted by her grieving mom and by her five siblings, her five sisters. But when they walked into the house, she says she was shocked at what she saw. Everything in the house was labeled by one of the five sisters. Somebody wanted the piano, and they had labeled it. Somebody wanted the dresser drawers, and they had labeled it. And there was this tension in the air, she said, in her family. That's what greed does. As a minister for 38 years, I've seen that a few times, how that families get together for a funeral, and there's a tension in the air because there's, there's a problem of greed. Who's going to get what? Maybe you can identify with that story. Maybe you've had the same kind of problem with an adult sibling. You've squabbled over an inheritance with your brothers or your sisters, just like this guy in Luke chapter 12. Or maybe you're married and you've argued about money over this past week, and that's not unusual. In fact, uh, there are some studies that say the number one reason for divorce are money problems, especially when you, a giver and taker, are married together. Maybe you're mad at your mom or your dad because they haven't bought you something that you recently asked for and they refuse to spend the money and so you're angry with them. Greed can cause conflict in relationships. Greed can cause conflict in business relationships. Some of you, if you own a business, maybe you've been on the short end of the stick when it comes to that. Uh, You've had a customer who expected you to give away the store, uh, taking advantage of you. Maybe you had a partner who cheated you in some fashion or you work for one of these multinational corporations and you found out a long time ago, really all they care about is money. They don't care about you. You're just a number and it's all because of greed. Greed causes conflict in relationships, in businesses, causes conflict among friends. And it could be something as simple as divvying up a check at Roadhouse. (laughs) Who's going to pay what? It may be over wedding invitations when you're hesitant to invite someone to a wedding reception because, you know, there's only so much money to pay for the meals, but you know so-and-so will probably get bent out of shape if you don't invite them. Or maybe you think, you know, hey, didn't we give them a $250 espresso machine and all they gave us was a $35 toaster? <laughs> Why should we invite them? You know, I had, I had a friend one time 
uh, in another state when we moved because of ministry reasons. I had left him a truck and several other items for him to sell. I was going to give him part of the money, and he was going to give me the money back. And uh, he sold everything, but he kept all the money for himself. And so I'm witness to the bank. That's a tough thing to get over sometimes. But the problem is when we value money and things and stuff over people, it's bound to cause conflict in our relationships when we think that stuff is more important than people. And by the way, it's even true about a relationship with God. Some folks would rather risk their relationship with God, even risk their eternity, than to let go of their stuff, than to let go of money. In fact, some folks even get upset when you even mention the subject of giving. So greed, number one, greed causes conflict. Number two, in this parable, we see that greed gives a false sense of well-being. Uh, look at verse 16 through 20 again. Hope you've got your Bible open. The land of the rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no other place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? I think we would probably all agree it's not good when God calls you a fool. <laughs> yeah, why did God call him a fool? Did he call him a fool because he was successful at farming and made a lot of money? That's not indicated at all. There's absolutely nothing wrong with running a profitable business. And God didn't call this farmer a fool because he sinned somewhere along the way. You don't read anywhere in this text. There's no indication that he, you know, he was charging inflated prices for his crops or he abused his employees or he was involved in a hostile takeover of some other farms. None of that is mentioned. By all appearances, this was a hardworking and honest guy. He had some business savvy. In fact, if you knew him, if he was a friend of yours, you would probably admire him. You would think, I would love to be like this guy. So why then does God call him a fool? Well, first of all, you notice this, this farmer failed to recognize the source of his wealth. Very important here. He sees himself as a self-made man. He gave all the credit for his success to his hard work, to his business expertise. If you look at verse 16 through 20, you'll see six I statements And, uh, you know, I this, I that. And four of them are I will statements, you know, as if he's master of his own destiny. I will, I will, I will. And you'll also find five my statements, you know, my crops, my barn, my grain, my good. What you don't find in the monologue of this farmer is God. You don't find him mentioned at all. And, you know, you would think farming would be one of the businesses where God's contribution would be noticed, right? Right? Because God is the one that provides the sunshine for the crops. He's the one that provides the moisture, the rain for the crops to to grow. He provides protection from the natural disasters. He provides uh, uh, all of it. Without God, there would not be a harvest. But this farmer is called a fool because he fails to recognize that God is the source of his wealth. How about us? Do we? Do I? Do, Do we recognize the fact that every dollar that we have every gift that we have, every dividend that we've earned is because of God, that it comes from God. And by the way, that also gives God a right, a significant right to say what we do with our money and how we spend it and where it goes. Another reason I think this farmer was referred to as a fool is because he failed to recognize the brevity of life. In verse 19, the farmer says to himself, soul, you have goods made up for many years to come. Take ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But of course, verse 20, but God said to him, you fool, this very night, your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? Do you see the contrast that's being drawn here? The farmer acts as if his earthly existence is going to go on forever and ever and ever, but it's not. He's investing everything in transistor, transistory stuff. And that's why God calls him a fool. And really, it doesn't matter whether you live 70 or 80 years or whether your life is shorter than that. If you're spending money on things that are fleeting, things that will pass away, God's going to call you a fool. Because you're not in spending it on things that last. Jesus is saying, you know, don't think about just the here and now. 
Don't spend your money just because it makes you happy today, just because it gives you a thrill this moment. Think about the future. Think about eternity. So greed, this farmer failed to recognize the brevity of his life. Now this, this leads us right in to the third lesson we learn about greed from Jesus here. Number three is that greed keeps us from being rich toward God. That's the next major point. Verse 21, Jesus sums up the story. He says, so is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see, part of what Jesus is saying is that what happened to this foolish farmer can easily happen to you and to me. God presents us with a clear choice in this verse. We can either store up things for ourselves, right? More clothes, uh, more square footage in a house, more, more lattes, more, more phone apps, more travel miles, more video games, or we can be rich toward God because Jesus is suggesting here that it's very tough to do both of those things simultaneously. Now, why is that? Why can't, why can't you do both? Why can't you store things on earth and be rich toward God? Well, there are a couple of very obvious reasons. Number one is money's a limited resource, at least for the vast majority of us, unless your last name is Gates, then it's probably a limited resource for you. The more we spend on ourselves, basic arithmetic would tell us the less we have to invest in the kingdom of God. It's a matter of arithmetic. You know, I know a couple of families here at Palmetto who diligently save up their money during the year in order to go to Honduras. There's some who, who, frankly, they have to sacrifice financially, even giving up some money uh, from their work in order to be able to attend a mission trip uh, going to Honduras. So they have to say no to some personal spending in order to say yes to Honduras. The point is that most of us don't have enough money to do everything that we would like to do, everything we would want to do. So if you've seen an ad, for instance, for like Compassion International, where they show these children who need food, they need to be fed, and you probably realize that you can't support one of those children and continue, for instance, maybe your eating out habits. Maybe you have to cut out sometimes of your eating out because you can't eat out at an expensive restaurant every day and still feed one of these children in Haiti. Or maybe you're thinking to yourself, you know, I'd love to be involved in helping the ministries of the church financially, but I've got this big car payment. So maybe it comes down to deciding, you know, maybe I get a cheaper car or maybe I get a used car that something has to give. Or maybe you think I'd love to give to our mission work in the Congo and help the church out there and that'd be tremendous, but you know, I'd really like to upgrade my iPhone or I'd love to go on a trip to Honduras, but I can't do that and go skiing, you know, this year. Money is a limited commodity. So you might not be able to do everything that you'd like. Sometimes personal expenditures are pitted against being rich toward God. And that can be such a problem in our lives. Now, the second reason why you can't sometimes do both is because many of the things which we spend our money on require time and attention that diverts us from God-honoring pursuits. Uh, Gordon McDonald. <laughs> According to him, he tells this story. He says, in ancient days, when the king of Siam had an enemy he wanted to torment and destroy, he would send that enemy a unique gift, a white elephant, a live albino elephant. These animals were considered sacred, Gordon writes, in the culture of that day. So the recipient of that elephant had no choice but to intentionally care for that gift. This elephant would take an inordinate amount of the enemy's time, resources, energy, emotions, and finances. Over time, the enemy would destroy himself because of the extremely burdensome process of caring for that gift. Gordon writes, our spiritual enemy uses the same strategy on us. He'd love to thwart us. He would love to keep us from engaging in God-honoring pursuits. And so he leads us to spend our money on things, he writes, that take a lot of time, a lot of energy away from God-honoring pursuits. Makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, you buy, you buy season tickets, right? To, to, for instance, the, the Gamecocks baseball. But because you have a lot of games to go to, maybe there's an area in ministry that you don't have time to serve in. Or maybe you buy a sailboat 
And so during the summer, you know, the only time you can sail is on the weekend. And so you miss out on worship services, maybe for a couple, two or three months in the middle of the summer. Or let's say you buy a health club membership in order to get in shape. And used to be, you would get up early and you would pray to God and you would read your Bible and you'd use that time early in the morning to do that. But now that you're getting up early and before work, you're going to the gym, you don't have time to do that anymore. Or let's say you pay for one of your kids to be on some kind of traveling sports team, but now Saturdays are taken up with ball games. And so when the church announces, hey, let's all go feed the homeless one Saturday morning, you're not able to come. Or God forbid they even plan those games on Sundays and you're not able to worship with the family anymore. See, here's the question. Are there any white elephants in your life? Are you spending money on things that take your time away from God? Because folks, that's a form of greed. The money isn't the problem, but it may be distracting you from God honoring pursuits. I wanna close this message by pointing out something very important. The only way that we escape the sin of greed is the same way that we escape any other sin in our life. And that's through the power of Jesus Christ and through the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ gave his life up on the cross as a substitute for our sins, that he took the punishment for all of our sin, including our greed, on him. He bore our sins in his body on the tree, Peter would write. He died and rose again so that all those who believe in him, all who would believe that he is the greatest treasure, that you could possibly have would be freed up to live for him. We're about to sing a song that's gonna prepare our minds to take of the Lord's Supper. And I wanna challenge you as you take the Lord's Supper this morning to remember what God has given to you and to remember that everything that you have comes from God and that one of the most dangerous diseases of the human race is the disease of greed. To ask God to remove that from your life through the power of Jesus Christ. All right, let's sing a song now as we prepare hearts and minds. family. I wanted to share, uh, along with what Mike has been saying, some ideas. There's a famous document that starts, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And an even more famous document, the Bible, that says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
when we all were objects of wrath, God at that time decided that we were desired, that we were people to be loved. And so God sent his only son through immaculate conception, through Mary to be born, to be killed, and then to be resurrected on the third day. And in that hope of resurrection, we have life with God. We have fellowship with him. When we put our faith and our trust in God, we then come into communion with him. And one of his apostles wrote something about that communion. It's a binary system that you're either in communion with God or you're not. You're either in the light or you're not. In 1 John chapter 2, it says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father on our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the same message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. And as we think about greed and not being willing to share, we need to evaluate whether we're going to be living for God and choosing the light or whether we're going to live in darkness and live a lie. And this celebration, this, this time of communion with us, is a time that we declare that we walk in the light with God and that we have fellowship with Jesus because of his blood and his broken body. And at this time, we'll pray for the bread. Father God, we thank you so much for this time, this time of fellowship with you, that we declare to be children of light, to be children who choose to love our brother, to be people who choose to love you and to obey your commands. Father, help us when we are attacked, when we are infected with the potential of greed. Father, help us to cling to you and to obey your commands to love our brother. And Father, we thank you so much for Jesus who died on the cross to give us the ability to have a communion and a fellowship with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we'll take our bread. The Apostle John also wrote a little bit later in 1 John chapter 3. He said, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. 
And it's interesting that in the Bible it would talk in the Old Testament how the blood was the thing that purified or wiped away the sins. And when people sinned, they would then go offer a sacrifice and an animal would die and its blood would be sprinkled on the altar. And when it burned up and went into the air, it was signifying that God was forgiving that sin, was rolling that sin forward. And Jesus, as the lamb, was offered for us and his blood was shed for us so that we would not have to die on the altar, but we could place our hope, our forgiveness on the lamb that was slain for our purpose. And for that reason, we remember the blood of Jesus. And we remember his blood that sacrificed for us on the cross. And at this time, we pray for this fruit of the vine that represents his blood. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for Jesus, the sacrificial lamb that was offered for us, whose blood was shed for us. God, thank you so much for being the sacrifice through the incarnate word, through God being made flesh and then offering himself for us. Father, we we do not comprehend in full right now, but when we see you, when you come again, we'll understand in full. And Father, thank you so much for the blood of Jesus shed for us. We celebrate being cleansed by his blood. Let's pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We understand that greed attacks not just our mind, it attacks our heart. We feel deeply about our money. <laughs> we feel deeply about what we spend our money on. And I think that's why God gives us this ability, this opportunity to reset. And we do that every Sunday in this giving, this offering time. It's a time to reset our heart, to, uh, to go ahead and drown out the greed and uh, to let go of that money so that we could acknowledge what really is truly important, and that is our relationship with God and the love of our brothers and sisters. And that's what this offering is about. It's about giving, which is the opposite of greed, about keeping. And I hope that you will remember to give so that your heart will not be full of greed, that greed will not have a, a stranglehold on your heart. But in giving, you are freed from that hold. So if you're giving online, we, we really encourage you to do that. Uh, if you're writing your check and mailing it here, go ahead, put the stamp on it today. Uh, make, a de make a decision not to be bound by greed. Uh, so let's pray about that freedom from greed now. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this time of giving, this time that we can declare that you are the Lord of our heart, that you are seated on the throne of our heart, and that we are not uh, the object uh, of what is important. Father, that the money that we have is simply to be used to do your purpose. And Father, we declare now and we release our hold on our funds that say, these are yours. And God, thank you so much for giving to us so that we could give to others. Father, we love you and we pray that the offerings that we make would build up the church, would share your gospel as we know our elders and our ministry leaders are using those funds for that purpose. And Father, we at this time celebrate freedom from greed in this offering. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord of all creation, all glory, earth, and sky, the heavens on your tabernacle, Thank you. 
declares your majesty. You are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of heaven and earth. Early in the morning, I will celebrate the Stumble in the darkness. I will call your name by night. God of wonders beyond the galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy. beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are You are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth. Good morning, church family. At this time, we're going to have the shepherd's prayer. Uh, during my prayer, I'll, I'll mention a few names early that are members here. But during this whole prayer, I'm thinking of specific families and specific situations. If you would go with me now in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning just asking you to be with us because we are dealing with such unusual times now. I ask you to be with our brother Pat. Our sister Melanie, uh, a friend of, of Lori Dukes, whose uh, friend has a husband, Jason, who is uh, suffering from the COVID-19 virus and is currently on a respirator. I just ask you to be with, with all of these as they recover from their illnesses. I ask you to be with all the health care workers and ask you to be with those that have not been directly affected by this COVID virus but are but are suffering from, from anxiety or depression just due to these circumstances. Dear Lord, I lift up our children, the youngest of which may not know what is really going on, but uh, their routines have been interrupted, and, and others who just may not understand what is happening right now. I ask you to be with our, with our young children who have had their, their school and their lives interrupted ask you to be with our with our teenagers and especially our our seniors in high school that have been looking forward to activities including their graduation and i pray that when things are safe they will have the opportunity to get together with their friends and classmates lord i lift up our college students who our classes were disrupted and They've had to switch to online classes, and I ask you to be with their, with their teachers as well who have had to carry on these classes in a, in a totally new format. Lord, I lift up our, our families who have, may have had their work interrupted or their hours reduced. I pray that their job and the work will return to normal soon. I'll ask, also lift up our families who 
um, who have just had their um, their lives disrupted in so many ways due to the uh, just unsure uh, unsure situation of our of our economy right now. Lord, I lift up our older members whose health may be a little more frail, and I pray for you to keep them safe, and I pray that we can get together with them soon so they can share their, their love and their wisdom with us. I ask you to be with our families and friends who are in the hospital or in retirement homes right now, as it's difficult, if not impossible, for us to visit them and in certain circumstances, it may be difficult for them to understand really what is happening. I lift up our friends that have recently moved, and I just pray that their transition to their new home and their new jobs is, is smooth and successful. I ask you to be with those that have had plans of, of family visits, of vacations, and even marriages been disrupted, and I pray things get back to normal where those things can can go on, but just as a, at a little later date. Lord, I'd be remiss not to thank you for the ways you've blessed us during this time. I thank you for our brothers and sisters in Honduras who've been able to carry on with their work of feeding the children, even though they've had to be a little a little creative in how to gather food and at this time, they're feeding more children now than they ever have before. We know things are a little difficult for us here, but uh, in third world countries where pantries are, are not filled, the, uh, the shortages, the inability to get food is, causes just much more disruption in their lives. I thank you for those that have been able to continue to work and have been able to retain their jobs. We look at that as a blessing. I thank you, your family, for our family here who has reached out to each other with phone calls or on social media and have been able to continue to love and support each other, even if it's from a distance. But Lord, most of all, I just thank you for you, where our faith where lies and our ultimate victory will occur. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today, and we hope you have a wonderful week. God bless.